Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! It is. I, mean, I know that uh, we filled our boots with Brexit yesterday. I, I, I don't know quite how to navigate this curious territory that we find ourselves in now, where we are divided according to knowledge. So yeah, I can't quite understand, genuinely can't understand, how anybody with a brain uh, or an IQ in double figures could have been surprised by the content of what Barnier said yesterday regarding the border in Northern Ireland. It was exactly what Theresa May agreed to in December, unless the British government managed to come forward with an alternative, a, a way in which we could continue to trade frictionless and free between those two territories, um, while also withdrawing from the customs union in a single market. It's her job to come up with an answer. The European Union, as they said they would do in December, yesterday unveiled the inevitable upshot of a failure on the part of the British government to do that. And yet, even, I mean, people I like and respect seem to be surprised by it. I, I genuinely now think that we've reached peak cult. I, 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 it is now simply the case that you either believe or you understand. If you understand, nothing should have shocked you yesterday. Everything John Major said is true. Everything Tony Blair says is later today will be true. And everything Barnier said yesterday is just true. The alternative is not to argue, it's just to believe that it's not true. That there are no arguments, there are no opinions involved in what Barnier did yesterday. It, 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 they are statements of fact contingent upon something Theresa May agreed to in December. But I guess, you know, everyone listening to this right now will break down according to either understanding it or just believing. And as we discovered yesterday, the new article of faith for the true believers is electronic checking at the borders. That is the new unicorn. So f on top of that, I don't know that we've got anything else to say. I, I, it's not frustrating exactly, but it's certainly, it can be a little enervating, I suppose, to just speak to people who are on the not understanding but believing side. And I know that's rude if you are but on that side, but it's also true. I don't know how much more mileage we can get out of that. I, I'm going to keep doing it, but I can't see anything that's happened in the last 24 hours that moves us on from yesterday. Um, if you disagree, get in touch quickly, because we're going to do Mystery Hour early this week at 11.45 uh, in order to leave the last quarter of the programme free for a visit to the studio from a very promising new young comedian whose uh, work you probably aren't that familiar with yet, but I've got a feeling he's going to be very big indeed very soon. His name is Ricky, Gerv Rick Ricky Gervais. So that's coming up at 12.45. Before that, we should talk a little bit more about homelessness. I haven't done a lengthy introduction. You've heard me talk to the mayor about it, and there are some people already on the line, so I think we'll break with tradition and, and just take them. So we haven't asked a specific question, and we, we, we haven't inflicted one of my torturous introductions on you. Let's just find out what people have to say about the issue of homelessness. That woman, Joe, Rachel's report, that just hurt, didn't it? Because, you know, it's not callous. It doesn't make you awful to not want homeless people sleeping in the communal areas of your building, but arguably when the temperatures go below zero... It does make you a bit awful. I don't know. Tim's in Regent's Park. Tim, what do you think? Good morning. Hello, Tim. Well, I think it's absolutely awful that, um, well, the churches, the synagogues, the mosques can't open their doors. I mean, there must be 10,000 um, churches. Well, a, a lot do. I mean, my local church does, but there are, there are logistical reasons. You need CRB checks. You need um, health and safety checks. You need all sorts of, well, you need volunteers. I, I mean, don't, don't take, this is going to sound like a dig at you, but it isn't. H have you sort to volunteer yourself? Have you, have you looked into getting involved in any of the schemes that you think there aren't enough of? I would say I'd love to find the time to do it. So that's a no that's then, mate. Selfish. Yeah, no, absolutely. But an app um, isn't really going to help someone who's... No, what it does is, if I've understood it correctly, you see someone who's in trouble. You might not have the personality or the temperament to want to go and talk to them and seek to help them yourself. So you have a choice. Either you report it via the app, which will give a geographical location of where the vulnerable person is, or you phone me and moan about the fact that other people aren't doing anything while you do NAF all, mate. 
Okay, and the lady that's been ushered away by the police. Yeah, what do you mean? That's a local church. Well, again, uh, the there are local churches yeah. in that area, but you, you, you heard the explanation that some people. We're talking to a bloke around the corner, Tim, who sleeps in a doorway because he doesn't want to go to the shelters. It's, it's never as simple as it looks to us from the outside. No, of course not, but I'm sure that someone would feel quite safe in possibly a house of God. Um, well, you've got a bit of a problem with Houses of God, by the sounds yeah. of it. I, I suspect you'll find... You heard the fella in Kingston who is trying to get more money out of the mayor to continue with his work. My, my local Church of England vicar, it's not my local church, she throws open the church hall as often as she can. I, I, I'm going to go out on a limb here, Tim, and say that the church and the houses of worship in this country probably do more to tackle homelessness and to help homeless people than any other organisations except the actual homeless charities. Yes, of course. <laughs> well, I'd, I'd, I'd just like to say that. Peace be with it's you. Fantastic church, <laughs> and it's closed. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I mean, that, that's a different question entirely, isn't it? You, you, you fill it up with homeless people, but there'll be no church if there ain't no worshippers on a Sunday morning. 10.50 is the time. Thank you for... Uh, Thank you for tolerating my mild brutality there, Tim. Daniel is in Enfield. Daniel, what would you like to say? Oh, hello, uh, James. Yeah, I did want to speak to Sadiq, but I didn't get a chance. But um, I was going to say, I wanted to speak to him about homelessness because six years in a row, uh, this country has uh, seen an increase in homelessness. And I'm in the borough where, in London, it's the second worst uh, um, record for homelessness. And it's a real concern because I went up central London a few weeks ago, and I was really shocked by the amount of homelessness uh, I, I was seeing around me. And I it's cyclical, like isn't it? It's, it's a weird one, because I moved to London in the early 90s, mm -hmm. and Lincoln's Inn Field, which is, for people who don't know, a kind of, um, well, it's a, it's a leafy garden square in the heart of London's legal district, but when I arrived at the London School of Economics, which is just around the corner, it was genuinely a shanty town. It looked like stuff I've seen in Southeast Asia. It had people living under tarpaulins, people in makeshift tents, makeshift shelters. You know when right-wing hypocrites sometimes say the poor will always be with us as a way of excusing the fact that they're not doing anything at all to help the poor, or I suppose some people are even worse than that, like Jacob Rees-Mogg who claims that poverty leading people to food banks is somehow uplifting. Is it not the case that there'll always be some homelessness because some people actively reje reject regimentation yeah. or... or, or, or Something like that needs to be like a three or four prong pronged attack. I mean, we need to work on the mental health aspect of it. We need to work on the addict addictions and the, the, that kind of aspect of it. And well, who should though? Me, who should understand. though? I can't understand. Sorry. Who I'm should do more? Yeah. Who should do more? Well, well, the government for a start. I mean, but the, the government seems no to... votes in helping the homeless, really, are there? No, of course. That's that's the thing, though, isn't it? I think they, it they might be. After. Yeah, that is that is the thing, but it's a disgrace. Isn't it? I mean, it, a first world country to be like that is, you know, we we seem to pride ourselves on being the fifth or sixth biggest economy, but it's all just blah blah, and it? it's all it's it increasingly all blah, is. Blah. And, and to be honest, it's one of the one of the sensible explanations for voting Brexit that I understand. When people keep hearing our economy is so strong, but the pound in their pocket mm -hmm. is worth less, and their wages have been stuck, and the cost of living in the shops is going up, it, it, it is blah blah. Actually, I, I'm sure there's a sophisticated economic explanation of about why we should all care about GDP and economic growth. But if if your personal financial circumstances are deteriorating and you keep getting told that the nation's financial circumstances are improving, it, it will create a sort of mindset that thinks, well, we need to move on to a different system. Unfortunately, of course, what happened in June of 2016 is that people voted to become rapidly worse off. 10.53 is the time. Is, is there... I, I love, you know, if you listen to this programme on even a remotely regular basis, we're a little bit addicted to... Um, magic moments, penny drops, light bulbs, the, the the idea that actually the more you talk and think about things, the more likely you are to come up with workable solutions, complicated answers to complicated problems, rather than the traditional territory of the phone-in, which is, which is the opposite of that. It's comforting lies and it's, it's simplistic, um, unworkable answers to complicated questions. But the homelessness one, as, as, as both of those callers reflected, there's just that we all have a sense that more should be done. We're not stupid enough to go down that anti-refugee rhetoric of saying, all right, then you put them in your bedroom if you care so much. It's, it's, it's a notion of what society means. And it is odd to reflect in the second decade of the 21st century that things do, as, 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 as the last fellow explained, seem to be going backwards. I don't know why.
10.54 is the time. Harry is in Ealing. Harry, what would you like to say? Hi. Yeah. It's amazing how nervous one gets when, when they get connected to yourself. It's only anyway. me, mate. It's only me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to be quick trying to get this. Right. Um, my wife is involved in the church. She volunteers for a church. I'd like to say that churches do do a lot. My wife volunteers for a, a church and they feed the homeless and they get they're allowed to sleep in the church hall yes. for about a month. Then it goes on to another church. And it, so for, throughout the winter, it goes to uh, various... My wife's church, they'll have them for a month. It'll be up to maybe 20 homeless people. But what I've come to realise that those 20 homeless people have to be registered yes. for them to be entitled to it. But they're not every homeless person wants to be registered because there's rules they have to abide by. So some volunteer to stay on the street. But not all. And, and not the, all. The, 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 the gentleman that we're talking to, my, my colleague, my producer Beth, has been speaking to him, who, who sleeps within shouting distance, really, of this studio. And, and his, his reasons for not wanting to go into, quote, the system are not kind of anti-authoritarian. They're, they're, they're almost the opposite. He, he, not to put too fine a point on it, he's, he's a bit wary of the company he'd be keeping. But to choose, this is... It's so cold, Harry. It's so unbelievably cold for, for for normal British people who haven't spent you know long periods of time in Lapland. It's so cold, but and, and when you better? see someone in a in a doorway, as I have done this morning, three people, I don't know what to do. Well, well I, for me, I can only speak personally. I would rather sleep with twenty strangers than sleep in the cold. Yeah, let maybe want to rephrase that, that right? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> in, 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 <laughs> but yeah, but that's because we've never been in those. We've never been in a room like that. We've never been in a in a in a in a hostel where a couple of chaotic people are holding court and and ruling the roost. We don't know what it's like. So that that's the point. You, you, there, we, there's a word here that none of us have used in the context of homelessness, and I, and I suspect partly for political reasons on 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 some people's part. It, what, what did what did we expect to happen when austerity? got sold to us as something we all had to buy into. Cannot people have a registered card so that just the general public know that this is genuine? So if I decided to... to well, we're to, doing uh, our no, values. We're bringing our values and ideas as, as, as people who live in homes and are fully paid up members of society and are, you know, integrated into the institutions and know what NHS numbers and national insurance numbers are. And we're taking our sensibilities and our ideas and trying to apply them to people whose lives very often are in complete disarray. That's correct. That's Isn't it? True. And that, that I guess, I, it makes me wonder about charities in general, actually, because... I want to live in a world where we don't need charities. And so every time you do something to help someone, in a way, you push that world ever so slightly further away. It's why people like Rhys Mogg love food banks, because it takes away the responsibility from eating ed educated multimillionaires to actually show any form of concern while attending church on a regular basis for society's poorest people. Food banks become uplifting because then looking after the poor and explaining why people in jobs can't afford to feed their families ceases to be a problem for conservative politicians. But I must say that church do do a lot. They do. I'm glad you rung in to mention about. that. No, because I, I understood the first fellow. Was it Tim? The one I gave a mild, a mild ruffling of the hair to for, for saying they should do more. They do a hell of a lot more than the rest of us do. And of course, the whole point about doing good in the name of Jesus, which is the religion I'm most familiar with, is you're not actually supposed to tell anyone when it comes to charity. The left hand is not supposed to know what the right hand is doing. So you need to get the message out to the homeless people, but you shouldn't necessarily be um, trumpeting it to your neighbours. Harry, thank you. Should we squeeze in one more? Alexander's in Plymouth. Alexander, what would you like to say? Um, I'd like to say that in May 2009, um, an experiment was done with homeless. Uh, was it with homeless people? Uh, there were 13 homeless troublemakers. Um, I'm, reading it. I'm reading this from a book I'm reading, I'm sorry. That's right. what's the uh, book? And, uh, uh, the book is by Rusko Brechman. Hmm? Uh, it's uh, Utopia for Realists. Okay, go on. And uh, I told uh, you this was a bit different to normal radio phone didn't I? Carry yeah, on, no. Alexander. The, these uh, 30 homeless people had racked up an estimated bill of £400,000 between them in social services, you know... Court all proceedings, all sorts of issues. Court proceedings, all that kind of stuff. So the, the, the city, the, the city uh, you know, administrators and stuff, with, you know, they're losing their minds. They're going, we've yeah. So much money. What, what are we going to do? So they gave each of them three hundred, three no, three thousand pounds between them. No, not between them. Per, each per, three per, grand per each. Person. Yes. Yeah, they gave them three th uh, three thousand pounds each. Left them, left them at it. Yeah. And, and what happened? Uh, well, or have you not got to that bit yet? Um, 
The suspense is that's the worst call ever. You just rung up and told us something and everyone wants to know how it ended and you don't know. Past it? I've gone past it. You've got, you mean you've gone past it? What happened? Quickly. Yeah. Uh, well, they were all off the streets. So it worked. After, after yeah, it worked. But they, I'm, there's two. I, I like it. I need to dig out the book. There are two problems with that. One, of course, is the the fact that um, he, he, that they would have had that maybe they never had a significant chunk of change in place to change life, uh, as in paying a deposit and things like that. The other problem, as ever, with everything that is rotten, disgusting, and unchristian about this country, is you can trace it all back to the Daily Mail. How the hell would the Daily Mail respond if homeless people were suddenly given three thousand pound handouts? And how would the herd, the flock, the sheeple, the forelock tuggers respond when asked how they felt about some homeless person being given three thousand pounds when you have to work for? your money. Getting an update on that book that uh, our previous caller referred to and then failed to provide us with the ending. The majority of the homeless people, the, the, the serious problematic, serial problematic homeless people in that experiment who were given £3,000 each. The majority found homes and jobs. A few used the money to buy drugs and alcohol, but overall it saved a, it saved a bunch of cash, which is interesting, isn't it? But as I say... The current government have to run the ruler. Everything has to go through the Daily Mail before they decide whether or not it is going to be um, proposed or introduced. And speaking of that ludicrous tyranny of power concentrated in utterly, utterly unaccountable people, the government have just announced that they're not doing Leveson. Um, they are not doing Leveson Part 2. That was the investigation into media regulation that would have focused particularly upon issues like police conspiring with representatives of the press um, to arguably uh, miscarry or contribute to miscarriages of justice. An awful lot of people are going to be very, not just cross about this, but profoundly upset because people who believe that their family members may have been victims of crimes covered up by collusion uh, will, well, they've just seen the prospect of answers taken off the table. Um, we'll talk to Evan Harris, actually, in, in a few minutes' time. He's the executive director of Hacked Off. But make no mistake, when Matt Hancock, the culture secretary, stood up in the House of Commons today, he was paying back in announcing that there would be no Leveson too. He was paying back the Sun and the Mail for their slavish support. Support that has, obviously, for anyone... Um, who understands anything, support that has become truly ridiculous now in the context of Brexit. These newspapers shouting absolute nonsense every single day. But it keeps Theresa May in her job for another 10 minutes. And the payback for that, there won't be any second investigation into Leveson. Remember when Rupert Murdoch said it was the humblest day of his life, sitting in front of that inquiry, the humblest day. Was that, that, was, was that Leveson? Pretty sure that was Leveson. Uh, and funnily enough, as I say this, someone's just tweeted me a photograph of Captain Snowflake Tony Gallagher, the alleged editor of The Sun, although it's impossible to confirm because he won't respond to any calls or requests for interview or emails, and he's protected his own tweets. But he did launch a Snowflake hotline in The Sun. Um, yeah, I, I'll say that again because you probably think you misheard. He launched a Snowflake hotline in The Sun for you to ring up and, and dob people in for being snowflakes, but he's had to protect his own tweets because, well, I don't know... Uh, I'm just looking at a photograph of him out for a jog at the Conservative Party conference with a chap called Boris Johnson. Uh, they're out jogging together, former mates, former colleagues on the Telegraph, but, you know, down with the elites, up with the people. I don't think you want to talk to me about Leveson. As you could probably gather, I could talk to you about it until, until 11.45 when we launch an early mystery hour. But historically, apart from the Millie Dowler intervention and uh, revelation in the um, phone hacking thing. I, 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 don't, I, I don't think there's a, an appetite to discuss this stuff. So we'll talk to Evan Harris. We may take it under advisement and move on. But I'd, I'd like to talk about something completely different now, actually. Um, I'd like to talk about marriage and why women are leaving it so late and why my sort of cautious suggestion may not necessarily delight you. I've also got some breaking news. Latimer Road Station is likely to be renamed Grenfell in memory of victims of the tragedy. The Mayor Sadiq Khan, after leaving this interview, spoke to LBC um, and revealed that Transport for London will be starting a consultation on ideas for a permanent memorial. But in the meantime, it's likely that the station, which is, I, I mean, literally in the shadow of the Tower Block, if, if you're not familiar with that part of the country, is likely to be renamed Grenfell, which is... Um, that's rather special, actually, because it means that it will always have a place in the national vocabulary, regardless of the fact 
that the current government um, doesn't necessarily seem to be keeping any of the promises that were made in the immediate aftermath of that tragedy. And I wonder why the newspapers aren't holding the government to account and insisting that they do keep the promises, that Theresa May does keep the promises she made in the aftermath of that tragedy. Oh, yeah, Leveson too just got cancelled. Newspapers can do whatever the hell they want. And the more they let politicians in power off the hook, the more likely they are to see investigations into their own corrupt practices and the dark soul of some newspaper editors and proprietors will go unnoticed by the rest of us. Great. Nine minutes after 11 is the time. Let's cheer up a little bit. Why are women now waiting until they're over 35 before getting married? Um, I, I, I find marriage fascinating. You know I do. And I get very... Um, What's the word I'm looking for? I mean, you're going to say pompous, overbearing and rude, but I, I, I'm thinking uh, protective, uh, nostalgic, possibly a little bit reactionary. I am such a traditionalist on marriage, and it is the worst example in my life of me thinking that because it's good for me, except possibly, I guess, streaming in schools and heavily examining. You know when you, 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 you get that um, outlook that's based entirely on a personal experience? So I think that examining children loads must be great. James, here's loads and loads of evidence that for the vast majority of children it's a very damaging and traumatic experience and probably explains why anxiety levels are rocketing in this country among young people. Yeah, I don't care. I loved the exams. I was really good at them and it meant I could doss around all year and then ace it right at the end and, and, and come out making it look as if I'd been working hard all year and quite often I'd do better than the kids who had. Yeah, exams are great. You, but you can't build the whole system around the fact that you're a bit of an idiot. Yes, I can. OK. Uh, anything else like that? Yeah, probably grammar schools as well. I know all of the evidence is that they are not good for the general population. In, in a purely utilitarian sense, they are bad. But I imagine not having been lucky enough to be adopted by the, by the mum and dad that I have and having the brain that I've got and getting into a school and having an opportunity to get a much better education than everybody else because I was a bit brighter than the average. Love it. That's great. Yeah, but what about everyone else who doesn't go? Yeah, sorry, still love it. It's great. And I've got a horrible feeling I might be the same with marriage, but I can't shake it. Only four in ten brides were under 30 in England and Wales in 2015. Women, in particular, are waiting longer than ever to wed, with the average age, the average age, passing 35 for the very first time. There are various theories on why this may be. You are now having to juggle your career with your mortgage, with your perhaps children that were born before marriage, and marriage has just sort of dropped off the priority list until a little later in life. I don't know that I'm going to buy that at the first hurdle. The, the, the second element of this story that I find engaging is... The incontrovertible evidence, and this is where I do get really sort of pompous and, and, and po-faced, the, the evidence is incontrovertible that once you get married, even if, or especially if you have children, you are more likely to stay together. The peacetime peak for marriage was the year I was born. The peacetime peak for marriage was 1972. 426,000 couples in England and Wales wed. Um, we could now be heading down to below the lowest ever figure, which was in 2009, which was pretty much half of what it was in 1972. But it's the average age that fascinates me. In 1970, it was 24, right? This is what intrigues me most. In 1970, the average age of a bride was 24. Circle that. In 1994, the average age of a bride passed 30 for the very first time, okay? And in... Last year, the average age of a bride in Britain passed 35 for the very first time. 35. Sometimes when we do these stories, there's a little part of me that wants to ask you what you think is wrong with me. I was 28 when I got married, my wife was 26, and I could not wait to get her up the aisle. I absolutely couldn't wait. Before I met her, I'd never really even thought about marriage. I'd always thought it's on the, it's on the horizon, it's on the agenda, it'll probably happen, it usually does. Um, the way I was raised means I'm unlikely to, to have children without getting married first, but you never know. Um, and then I met my wife. And, I mean, seriously, it sounds like something out of Mills and Boone. Within days, I knew I wanted to marry her. We went on holiday, and I told my mum, before we went on holiday, I was just wondering whether I'm breaching privacy on this one, but I told Richard and Judy this on the telly years ago, so it's in the public domain. My wife can't tell me off afterwards. I told my mum, before we went on holiday, we've been going out for less than six months when we booked a holiday together. 
um, went to Spain, told my mum before we went I was going to propose, and then bottled it every night. I got so drunk, trying to pluck up the courage. It's possible I did propose one night in the back of a taxi, but I was slurring so badly she had no idea what I was talking about. Sangria is an evil drink, you know. It's a really evil drink, because it's usually got a bit of brandy in it, and you don't realise, you think you're drinking weak lemonade, or wine-flavoured pop, but it's got a spirit base to it quite often, sangria. The real stuff does. I was absolutely mullered. So the final night of the holiday, we'd been away for a fortnight, worst holiday of my life. I spent it in a, in a, basically drunk, hungover, or in a state of borderline toxic anxiety. I was just sure she'd say no, and then everything would go wrong. Last night of the holiday, finally plucked out the courage. And the only reason I plucked out the courage to ask her on the last night of the holiday was because I told my mum that I was going to do it. I couldn't go home and tell my mum that I bottled it. Luckily, she said yes. Not immediately, I, I have to stress. Um, but she did say yes. And this leads me to wonder whether the real reason why women aren't getting married until they're older is that they haven't met the right man yet. 03456060973 is the number that you need. Particularly women, because that's the statistic that we're examining. If you've met the man with whom you want to have children, ergo you want to have a future, why are you not marrying him sooner? 0345 And don't talk to me about money either, because that's simply not true. Marriage is for life. It's not just one day. Why are women now older than ever before, before they get married? 0345 973 We've only got half an hour on this, so hit the numbers now. You will get through. What, tell me about your situation. Because it's not really, I don't care about getting married. This is a postponement of the nuptials. So you can't ring me up and say, I don't want to get married. This is why you're leaving it so late before getting married. I'll take any answer you've got. But, but ideally, don't have your tongue inserted too far into your cheek. Because I would quite like to learn rather than just lampoon. It's 11.16. That number, once again, is 0345 Why are women, why are brides older than ever before. It's 11.16, and um, I, I am being heteronormative. I, I know it sounds like I'm sneering when I say that word. I promise you I'm not. I'm, I'm trying to learn. Uh, so many times uh, in such a short section of speech, you repeatedly spoke of marriage as, as being between a woman and a man. I know you're not homophobic at all, but being mindful of our language perpetuates heterosexual relationships as the norm. I should have clarified, the research is about opposite sex marriages. Um, uh, that, that is what has been counted by the Office of National Statistics figures. So I wasn't being heteronormative. I'm happy to say, but I was being, um, I, could, I could have been clearer and will continue to be. 21 minutes after 11, Dr. Evan Harris is uh, the former MP and now executive director of Hacked Off, a campaigning group which has been um, uh, toiling away in the shadow, some would say, uh, to, to make sure that Leveson 2 happens, that the proper and promised investigation into alleged corruption and indeed collusion between the Fourth Estate and in some cases um, major police services goes ahead. So I'm very interested in your immediate reaction to Matt Hancock's announcement a few moments ago, Evan, that it ain't going to happen. Well, it's a betrayal of the victims who were promised this uh, directly, personally, in a meeting by David Cameron, a meeting I attend. This is the victims said, of phone hacking. The victims of phone hacking and press abuse. I mean, the, Joe, the, the McCann family, uh, uh, Christopher Jeffries, these weren't hacking victims. These were ordinary people who, who were monstered or, or, or intruded yes. upon by the government, including the police officer's family investigating the murder of Daniel Morgan, whose suspects were associated with, with the news of the world and they were hacked and put under surveillance and with a view, in my view, to being able to put pressure on them to drop the inquiry. Now, uh, that promise was given to those victims by, by the Prime Minister uh, successively. He was explicit in terms of saying, yes. don't worry about the delay between part one and part two. It will happen. I know you're worried about that, but it will happen in exactly the same way that he said to the victims of the Grenfell fire. Which, where, where people are also worried that, that, that part two may never happen. And I don't think anyone can trust this government anymore. Well, it was, it was a, di a different prime minister uh, uh, over Grenfell, of course. Indeed, but the same principle will yes. apply, that they'll want to protect their friends in the industries that might be subject, and councils that may be subject to political, um, uh, to, uh, to criminal investigation. The second point is that it's a betrayal of the public interest. It must be in the public interest to have an inquiry into the terms of reference of Leveson 2, which are to find out the extent of the criminal wrongdoing and News International and other 
newspaper organisations, because at the time of the Leveson inquiry, we know, because a judge has said, mm. that Trinity Mirror executives, a left-wing newspaper group, misled the inquiry. That's in, that's a judge has found that in the civil trials. Secondly, to discover the extent of the cover-up by these large corporations of, of the criminal wrongdoing that took place. And this will be the first example of the press campaigning for an, a cover-up by an industry not to be investigated. The third thing is police corruption. That, as you mentioned in your introduction, uh, 30 public uh, servants, police and public servants, went to prison for accepting bribes. No one has been held to account for organising those bribes, which were probably more widespread than just the 30 police and public officials. And fourthly, why it was that when all, everything was known about the News of the World and all the people involved back in 2006, why the police accepted the one rogue reporter lie of News International and its executives. So that's why it's important that this goes ahead. And I'm sure this decision, since it goes against the views of the, the chair, the judge, the, who's chair, who chaired the inquiry, will be judicially reviewed. Well, that, are you sure about that? Parliament. Are you sure about that? Because Matt, Matt Hancock said, said earlier that Sir Brian agrees that the inquiry should not proceed on the current forms of reference. But on, a, on, on amended terms of reference. I've not well, seen no, what you his didn't, view is. No. But that is clear to... to so yes or no? Does the judge think the inquiry should go ahead? Yes. Well, you're being a bit disingenuous there. I mean, we will have to speak to Leveson himself, but but you clearly weren't well, aware that Han you, you clearly publish. weren't aware that that Hancock had referenced Leveson and said no, that he I, agrees. I saw the statement an hour ago. I saw the statement an hour ago, and Leveson does not agree that the that the um, he de does not agree that the inquiry should be cancelled. The statement, and this is what the weasel words of the minister were, yes. says that, that Leveson agrees that the current terms of reference should not proceed, but it should proceed under different terms of reference. It is a fact that the government have rejected his view. I believe it's the first time that's ever happened in an inquiries act under uh, uh, by, uh, in an inquiry under the inquiries act. Yes, and I think Leveson will publish his views as to why he thinks it should proceed. And we will um, we, we will transmit and amplify them when he does. You must have known this was coming. It was hinted at pretty broadly in the manifesto last year, yes. wasn't it? Yes, the, 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 the Conservative Party uh, did indicate in advance that they were going to betray the victims and renege on their promises, and we've been arguing as strongly as we can. And you say in the shadows. It's only in the shadows because this is the one scandal, the one story that much of the press won't cover. But we've been campaigning and gathering evidence as to why the, um, the inquiry should go ahead. And if, the, if there's nothing to see, then why would the press object to looking at why the Hillsborough um, newspapers came out in the way they did. What was the connection between the government at the time and the police? I mean, that is a live issue mm. because there's recently been an inquiry. Secondly, they'd be interested in knowing why it was the Daniel Morgan inquiry, uh, the Daniel Morgan murder inquiry was sabotaged, as is alleged, in, with detailed evidence by newspapers who were connected to some of the suspects. Do you, have you spoken to Alistair Morgan? Have you spoken to Alistair yet, yeah. Daniel's brother? We're, regu we're in regular I know you are. with Alistair, yes. and he'll be furious that yeah. the, the Leveson inquiry is... Um, Leveson to inquiry, the government is seeking to, to quash it. There is a panel looking into the, the reasons why that murder inquiry failed so many times, but that panel does not have the power to require the police and others to give evidence. That's why an Inquiries Act inquiry, one under the Inquiries Act, is so important because it forces the police and the newspaper executives to give documents and to give their evidence. And I think it will emerge in the next few days and weeks that a number of newspaper executives committed perjury at the part one of the Leveson inquiry. And I and how will it emerge? Will how will it emerge, Evan Harris, given that you're, you're essentially asking the, the, them to police themselves? Well, fortunately, there is uh, litigation ongoing where the, uh, where the News of the World and The Sun are being sued for not only hacking voicemails, but illegally obtaining the medical records and bank records of people of interest, okay, without a sufficient or any, in most cases, public interest in so doing. Fishing expeditions. That, that, yeah, fishing expeditions and where there's just no public interest. Who cares about who's sleeping with who? doesn't give you the right to access medical records. Now, that case alleges that there was a, a criminal conspiracy to cover up information at the Sun and the News of the World and alleges, which has not been admitted by News International, no. News UK as they are now,
that there was hacking at the Sun. That case will come to trial in October. In court hearings, it's already emerged that News, News UK are not denying any of that. They're simply not admitting it. And they're going to be forced to give evidence. Uh, and the judge will make findings. And if the judge makes findings that there was a, a cover-up, then there'll have to be another criminal inquiry. And then the government will look stupid having given in to Dacre and Murdoch yet again over investigating a cover-up. Do you, you, see, it, you see it that simply, do you? Of a cover-up. You see it that simply. We, we, we know that there are private dinners with, with both of the people you mentioned. We know that David Davis returned early from Brexit negotiations to dine and presumably update one of them. We know that the, the um, uh, relationships Ooh. between power and the press are um, probably more toxic than they've ever been in, in living memory. Is This is just payback, is it, for, for continuing not to tell the truth about Theresa May's Brexit negotiations? I don't think it's just about Brexit. I think there's been a long standing. This has been going on for years, this backsliding from Leveson. Sometimes there's a deal. And Cameron did call it, though. Cameron, Cameron, sorry to interrupt you, I'm late for the news, but Cameron did act in good faith. I, I, I appreciate he's arguably the most discredited politician now for a century, but when he called it, he meant it. Well, we thought he did. To say, I was in the room with the Dowler family yes. on that, in that July... When, he, when they gave him a hard time, there's how can we trust you politicians? And he said, I give you my word. Now, if the Conservative Party isn't prepared to honour the word to a grieving family who were uh, outrageously uh, intruded upon, if they're not prepared to honour a word of a former Conservative Prime Minister, then what sort of Conservative Party is it now? It is... Well, there's a, members uh, of it are calling John Major a traitor today. I, I mean, actually, literal MPs, Conservative MPs, are yeah. calling a former Conservative Prime Minister a traitor. Yeah. So this is not... I mean, the Cameron angle is not unprecedented, is it? Indeed. There are Conservative parliamentarians who support our position and support the victims and support the public interest in this. So I wouldn't write off the whole of the Conservative no, Party. No, of course. And the Conservative Party doesn't have a majority, especially the Conservative Party that wants to bend over and allow the press to do to it what it wants. It doesn't have a majority in the House of Commons and certainly not in the House of Lords. So there is still hope for our democracy to... Um, to, to see sense and say, look, let's have the inquiry that was promised. There's clearly a lot that's been going on. There will be more revelations in the next few days and weeks. And just because it's not covered in the newspapers doesn't mean our broadcasters, who are bound to have balance in their, under their terms of their regulation, won't cover this stuff. And we're launching a petition today to urge the government to... Um, uh, Parliament and the government to change this decision and we'd invite people to go to our, our website at www.hackinginquiry.org later on. Evan Harris, Dr Evan Harris, Executive Director of Hacked Off. Many thanks indeed. It's 11.31. Carrie says women are no longer obliged to marry the first man who comes along. We can have careers and fun before trying to find someone we're truly compatible with. It's very nicely put. And Lynn, um, almost at the other end of the telescope. Uh, she says, James, we have to wait for men to grow up and get it out of their system or the going out and getting drunk with their mates. This happens when they are about 40 years old. <laughs> Hence, women are older by then. Uh, do you think so? Are you saying different things or the same thing? I mean, is Lynn saying that she, she, you meet the person that you're truly compatible with quite early, but then you have to let them go off and be idiots for a decade or two, at the end of which time true love will conquer all? I, I don't know. No, all I do know is that I'm... It's one of my rare areas of, of old-fashionedness. Actually, that's not true. I'm probably old-fashioned in lots of ways. It's one of the rare areas where I, I'm fairly comfortable being old-fashioned rather than trying to move with the times and learn the new stuff. Speaking of which, the, the Ricky Gervais um, uh, special that he's here to talk about later in the programme talks a lot about um, the issues of offence and, and that, those issues of moving with the times. Talks about trans issues in characteristically bold fashion. I don't know if I'm going to have the guts to tell him this, but when I watch Ricky Gervais, and I'm not going to pretend otherwise, I just think he's a genius, I love him. Uh, it's going to be a really hard-hitting interview. There'll be blood on the carpet, I'm sure. I always think of that Jack Nicholson film, as good as it gets, when he tells um, to Ellen Hunt, he tells the heroine of it, the, the romantic lead, that she makes him want to be a better person. It's one of the best lines ever written. You make me want to be a better person. It kind of defines love for me. Ricky Gervais makes me want to be a less good person. He makes me want to be a worse person. Because he's so good at, 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 at exploding so much of these sort of homilies of our age. Anyway, we'll, we'll touch on some of that. In the meantime, we are talking about why 
women are putting off marriage for longer than ever before. Alexandra is in Edinburgh. Alexandra, what do you think? Hi, James. Hello, Alexandra. So, um, well, I think the interesting part, and it might sound old-fashioned, but I think, well, when I think about um, professional women, and in the age group you mentioned, yes. in the 20s, that have been in long relationship, and that would include like more than five years, for yeah, instance. Yes. It's usually the guy that hasn't asked them yet. Oh, gosh. And, and you're speaking from experience that... before anybody starts sharpening their cudgels. You, you, you're, you're saying you have friends, possibly you, you're in this category yourself, I'm not sure, but you have friends who would like to marry their current partner, but they still subscribe to the school of thought that says the partner has to ask. Well, even though it's like quite old-fashioned, old but most... Women, I know that professional as well. I'm going to only mention professionals okay. that have been in relationship for over five years. I know maybe six couples like this. Really? Seven. Yes, and uh, it can be that they're all bad, all these girls, and nobody wants to marry them. Well, I'm sure that's unlikely. Staying with them for a long time. And that could be like 10 years as well. So <sighs> well, why aren't the men. Because I, I get quite. I don't know, quite old school about this and I, and I think that men who don't marry women they love are essentially behaving irresponsibly. I think that they're behaving in a way that al allows them to think they're keeping their options open when in fact reality, especially if children are involved, should have, 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 have cancelled out those options. Why aren't these men proposing to these women? Well, in their defence, hmm. because I, it's not like to blame them at all. I think it's just... Well, because there are children involved in some cases, and it, uh, which is extreme, in my view. But, Say that again? Uh, I didn't follow that. In some cases, there are children, but in yes. the defense, for the guy, at least, I think they're waiting for conditions to be a bit better, like, okay, maybe when I yeah. have a job that is stable... Okay, so so there's always there's a sort of a, a, a postponement element to it. Incorrigible FCA, one of my favourite contributors, um, takes it a little further and says people are increasingly led to believe that they are entitled to perfection, so they delay and delay in the hope of something better coming along. One day you wake up and you're 40 and you're already past it. I hope that isn't the fate that your friends are looking forward to, Alexandra. <laughs> I don't think so. Um, I think after nine years, I think they're pretty sad that this is the person they're going to stay with or like 11 years even but it's just a matter of like it sounds maybe scary when they don't have a job they know they can be stable or a house of their own uh, yeah i think that's probably something that, that that my age group disqualifies me from properly understanding for the for the very simple reason that getting on the property ladder as we've spoken about i mean a million times on this program getting on the property ladder with a relatively modest income was perfectly plausible 18 years ago, when I got married, you could still get a 100% self-certified mortgage. I'm not saying it was a good thing, but it was a very different thing from now. In fact, yes, I, I mean, that was the deal. I, 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 Mrs. O'Brien and I had both lived with people before um, uh, and said that we didn't want to do it again. Uh, the next time we moved in with someone else, it would be because we were married. So I bought a flat and got married in a week, having previously spent 28 years being the most irresponsible human being on the planet. Quite remarkable. She's still not come to her senses. Joe's in Hoban. Joe, what do you think? Oh, I um, I agree with one of the call, um, one of your um, listeners who turned and said that women are looking for perfection and oh. they're looking for the one. And oh, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm taken. I'm so sorry, I'm taken, Joe. <laughs> I know, Dan. <laughs> Never mind. Um, and um, I think also that what what I I agree with what you're saying. I think that um, it's irresponsible, especially if there are children involved. I've got a friend of mine, and I am. Um, I said to her, um, "Well, are you yeah. are you going to marry your partner?" And she said, "No, we're having problems." And and she's got a kid with him. Yeah. And you're just thinking, "Well, why did you have a child with somebody that you're in a relationship that's having problems?" Yeah, and some people think, I mean, that could have happened within a marriage. People think a child yeah. might bring us together, don't they? I hope I'm not being too anecdotal. It, it, the idea that, you know, we, well, it, we need to grow up and we need to take our responsibilities yeah. seriously. If we have a baby together, it will rekindle those. But it is odd, isn't it? And, and it makes me it feel is. a bit judgmental when I sort of say I don't really understand people who haven't... No, I think it's 
No, I, I don't care. I think the people who do that are uh, downright irresponsible. Well, let's not and get carried not away, Joe. This is this is no, the this is the friendly liberal show. You, there are plenty of other places you can go to put the boot into people and tell yeah, them they should all get sterilised if they haven't got hundred thousand no, pounds in the bank. No, I know that you're that not. I'm putting all. words in your mouth in a vastly and vilely yeah, unfair yeah. fashion. Yes. God. God. Your poor wife. Sorry, anyway, you're telling me. <laughs> you know, I don't know any of this at home. That's why I get it all out no. of my system at work, Joe. Yeah, well, this is it, you know, fair enough. But I, I just think it's um, downright irresponsible of people to have, have children in that situation. I know of a couple who, they had three kids. Um, the husband died and the, and the wife had a really, really tough time. And oh. They weren't married. Right. And the wife had a really tough time of it, sort of sorting out his affairs. And it does make life. A, it does make life a little harder. I mean, yeah. uh, uh, common law is is there is really no such thing. Although I am I am going to. Uh... I'm going to politely reject your description of irresponsibility. I, I've got nephews that were born um, without their parents being married and they're, they're being raised in just as loving and delightful environment as as their cousins are. Joe, thank you. Um, it's 11.45. We're supposed to do Mystery Hour. Should we do Mystery 45 minutes? Is it going to confuse people? Beth, what do you think? Do we do Mystery Hour at 12 or do we do it now? Because loads of people want to talk about this. Ricky Gervais is coming in at 12.45. Can we do a mystery 45 minutes or do we start mystery? I'm going to make an executive decision while you enjoyed this. We were just trying to make a list of people that we would actually be so keen to talk to on the programme that we'd interfere with mystery hour. At the moment, we've only got one name on the list. That, that name is Ricky Gervais. There must be others. Prime Minister? I don't think I'd be allowed to turn down an interview with the Prime Minister. I, I did a very, very, very soft hand on the tiller of this programme, but I don't, I don't think that carrying on our fun and games on a Thursday afternoon when the pr Prime Minister was available for interview would be permitted by the authorities. So, yeah, probably that. Who else? Lord Lucan? Yeah, we'd have, to, we'd have to clear the decks for Lord Lucan. But otherwise, we, we are... Um, Breaking the habit of a lifetime and interfering with mystery hour in order to accommodate Ricky Gervais at 12.45. It's funny, speaking of lists of people that you'd like to meet and not meet, one of the elements of his new routine, his new show, um, involves an explanation of why he'd rather have Adolf Hitler around for dinner than a child with a food allergy. I, I told you, the man, is, the man is evil. Brilliant, but evil. We shall... Uh explore that theory further no doubt when he joins us i'm going to kick mr hour off as normal at 12 because some people tune in just for it and they won't know what the uh, i hate them all with a vengeance i don't know what they think i'm doing for the other 14 hours of the week barely mentioned brexit and there is obviously a danger that people listening from 12 won't have heard the first bunch of questions so they won't really know what's going on so we'll start mystery 45 minutes doesn't have a ring to it that does it Three quarters of an hour. Mystery three quarters of an hour from 12. Before that, a little bit more on why women in particular are waiting longer than ever before getting married. Rabia has sent me a brilliant tweet, and it is very, very arresting, this. She says, at the risk of sounding like a gran, partnership, children, and future building are all part of a person's evolution and emotional growth. I agree with all of that. Could this property issue be arresting a whole generation's development? That's actually fascinating, because I don't know what it's like to be working hard without any capital. Because uh, the only capital most of us have is a home. That's what you pay your mortgage, and at the end of the game, you, you own it. That's the idea. And that, to me, was a crucial part of... of, of, of being ready for a family and wanting to get married. And we know that huge swathes of the population who 20 years ago would have been in a socio-economic bracket that considered property ownership to be not just possible, but, but peremptory almost, now don't. That's a really, really interesting question. That's PhD thesis territory. Paul's in Lewisham. Paul, what would you like to say? Oh, hi there, hi there, James. Um, yeah, I'm on the other side of it a little bit. Um, I, I, obviously, I'm, I'm a bloke. Um, we've been in a relationship for 10 years. Yes. Um, we've just been engaged this year. Um, she proposed to me. That's nice. Um, but, but she proposed to me because we talked about it a few years ago and she was just... Um, she felt very nervous still about the whole thing, despite being in a relationship for so long. So I just I left it up to her, really. So it was and, and in in her case, it was it was a sort of eggs in all your eggs in one basket type anxiety, was it? 
Um, I, I don't know, to be honest. I, I obviously didn't... didn't <laughs> you, you really are a bloke. Way. You really are a bloke, aren't you? So you had a big heart-to-heart about why she didn't want to get married, but you can't remember what the reasons were. I love oh, you, no, mate. She, she just, she just <laughs> felt very nervous, really. I think it's... it's, it's didn't it's, you say, it's, why, it's, darling? Really why, 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 why are you nervous? No, I don't really. She just told me she's nervous, mate. I got my orders. I don't need to know why. I knew what to do. I held off. I kept my foot off the pedal, and then when she was ready, she asked me. Well, at the end of the day, it's just a piece of paper. We've been together for ten years. Don't say that at the wedding. Not, don't say that at the wedding. Don't, not, don't say that at the wedding. Don't say that at the wedding. Don't, don't say it, that. Don't, stop talking over me when I'm talking over you. Do not say at the end of the day it's just a piece of wedding, just a piece of paper. While she is pulling her hair out and running up and down the country trying to make everything perfect for your big day, Paul. I don't think you know us well enough. I, I think well, the roles will be reversed in that. In that. Well, scenario. you'll be doing all the planning. Probably, yeah. I can put you in touch with a great singer. <laughs> well, <laughs> how um, did she at propose? The end of the day, we've got nothing. Stop extra, saying extra, at the end of the day extra, as well. Extra, how, extra proof, to how, really. how did she propose? Um, on a nice bridge in a country park outside a bar. That's rather sweet. And did you have no idea it was coming? No, I was um, completely a uh, typical man. No, no, no clue what. Uh, going did on. she? Did she have a ring with her or anything like that? Um, she had a wood ring, as in a piece of a tree. That's that was... so sweet. Did she go down on yeah. one knee? Um, she Can't cried remember, mate. and Can't... then threw a kind of parcel at me and, what? um, just, just didn't say very much. Oh, mate, That's you're going to love it. You're an old romantic. You're just pretending. You're playing to the lads in the gallery with all this piece of paper nonsense. Oh, no, no I, I do want to get married. I know you do. But it's just, it's, no it's buts. we've got, we've got stuff to sort out with a house, you know, stuff to sort out with ourselves. It's mainly finance, to be honest, because you're looking at 10, 15 grand minimum. No, you're not. You can do it for involved. 150 quid. Not with a big Irish family, James, you know that. No, this is a fair point. There are there are demands. All the, all the people you've spent most of your adult life avoiding, you have to actually take out a second mortgage to get them drunk and full of food on your big day. Paul, God bless you, mate. Hey. Good luck. Cheers. Joseph's in Queen's Park. Um, why are men ringing me on this? I don't know, but Paul was, was a valid contributor. Let's hope Joseph is as well. Joseph, what would you like to say? Good morning, James. Hello, um, Joseph. Uh, it's just a very quick one, actually. I, so I, similar to the last call, I've been my girlfriend for seven years. Um, we don't actually live together yet, but we're, we're, we're looking to rent a place uh, together fairly soon. Um, uh, but, How old are you? Look, I'm four, 28. No, I was married at your age. I was married at your age, son. <laughs> and my mum had me. And my mum had me at her age. Yeah. Um, I, I think, I think it, like, as you touched on earlier, it's a generational thing. So my girlfriend, we've we both got good jobs, both surveyors, um, but, but she doesn't want to fork out potentially 50, 100,000, whatever it is weddings cost, what? Um, w- without, without, having, without having sort of financial security in the form of a house. Um, so she's told me not to propose to her until we're living together in something that we actually own. Fair enough. Um, yeah. That, yeah. That, could us, that could put us back years. I mean, that could put us back... That could be 30, 31... But, but you sound as if you've made a tacit commitment. You sound as if you both think... You both speak and behave and, and, and plan as if you will be together forever. Well, we are, yeah. Oh, sure. I mate, mean, that's seven, sweet. seven years, James. Well, like, yeah, I've been married for 18, years. pal. You're not going to get any flipping gold <laughs> clocks off me for seven years without ever living together. That's I don't not. Think you get a gold, gold, gold clock any, for any marriage, will you? <laughs> <laughs> It's 11.57. It makes sense. I guess the world's changing and I sit here. I'm like one of those old people who says, well, I bought a house. I didn't have any problems at all. I bought a house. And you say to them, yeah, but you were earning a grand a year and your house cost three and a half grand. So it was three and a half times your annual income. That's how you managed to buy a house. Young people these days, they spend it all on avocado toast and iPhones. And I say, yeah, but these days you'd need 25 times your annual income to get on the housing. Yeah, well, they don't know their boss. Some of them have got trade. I sound like one of those people. The reason why people are postponing marriage until life has gone on a little longer is because life is very different from how it was 18 years ago when um, I made Mrs. O'Brien the luckiest woman alive. Gina is in Waltham Forest. Gina, what would you like to say? Oh, honestly, James, I was so on your side. And then over the years, oh, my gosh. What? Well, well, there are two reasons, both of them from caution. I worked in the city most of my young life. Yeah. And a lot of my professional female colleagues were getting divorced and the, the common reason was oh we were just too young just too young oh, okay that would put you off a bit yeah so that got that in my head mm. and then secondly by the time i did meet the person i was madly in love with i had my home I had my career and everything and yeah. it just felt as if his finances would have sent us backwards 
Right. So we hung on, but we lived together, we had children, literally everything as if the only thing missing was we weren't married. Right. After quite a few times of proposing, just like you, within the first week of meeting me, he proposed. I, I didn't do that. I, 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 I knew very early that I was going to, but I didn't propose for, for about um, about 20 weeks. Oh, OK. Well, OK, late, late bloomer then. Well, yeah. 20 <laughs> weeks? I was going to speak to people here who've been waiting 20 years for the man to propose. It took me 20 weeks. I'm Mr I Romance. Well, well, I thought I realised I, I felt I was lucky and it was brilliant and everything was fine. Yeah, there's a big butt coming. I like well, big butts. Oh, yeah. Fast forward. Yeah. And then as we got older, we, well, basically we were together for 15 years and within three years of getting married, I decided I wish I hadn't. Oh, no! For reasons that I won't go into. Oh, well, you kind of have to, a bit. I mean, you can't, because, I mean, it, well, obviously not if it involves, I don't know, chinchillas or, 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 or criminal act. But the, what, what changed briefly and simply? What, what shifted? What did marriage, did marriage change something between you or not? It, you re Oh, dear. He, he, he felt being married made him, would have made him feel more secure, which is fair enough, because yeah. he met me established. Yeah. But what happened was that insecurity, when you get married, it's who you are. It's who you are. Yeah. And that, so that insecurity right. got worse uh, and worse and worse. Uh, to the point where my children, who, you know, you stay together for the children because I'm such a traditionalist, yeah, yeah, the ones yeah. that said, Mum, really? This ain't working. No, honestly, you still got it. You could be a cougar. <laughs> Let's leave it right there, Gina. You'll always be a cougar to me. It's a fascinating relationship with your children. Girl, it's just gone 12. I do miss Tata.